Thank you. 
Amen, church. Let's keep worshiping God.
Go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning. I'll try that one more time. I know it's a little hot out, right? A little hot yesterday. I helped some folks move yesterday, so I'm, I'm still a little hot myself. So I'll try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. So it's great to see all of you. Welcome to the Worcester County Church of Christ. We're great that you, uh, grateful that you're here. And we're excited to see all of you, whether it's your first time visiting or uh, you're a regular and you're here every Sunday, uh, we're glad that you came out to worship God with us. I want to let you know you're in for a treat today, so hopefully you've enjoyed the singing. We're going to keep singing and keep belting it out, and I uh, want to welcome all of you to join us in that. You're going to hear some great sharing today and some scriptures on the cross, uh, and then as always, some awesome preaching, uh, which is great for us, right? It's not just about living on Sunday, it's living every day of the week, right? So getting that charge that as we leave here, uh, to be inspired throughout the entire week. So uh, I want you to, uh, to know that, to encourage you that you're in for a real treat today, uh, as we are every Sunday. So I'm going to say a prayer, and we are going to continue worshiping. Good morning, Most High. It's great to be uh, in your presence. Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to worship you. God, thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, Lord, thinking about that we are united in you. Father, many different backgrounds and ethnicities, so much diversity here in this room with one united goal, and that's connecting with you, God. And we're so grateful and thankful for that opportunity, Lord. I pray be with our hearts as we sing, uh, as we hear scriptures on the cross, uh, and as we're fed from your word, God. Help it to change us, to impact us, and inspire us uh, to really be light, God, to be people of the light and really help shine on this dark world, Lord. We thank you. We love you. It's in your glorious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
stand before some for communion, but this is what we stand for. There is power in the blood. seven minutes, so I got a little extra time, and I just want to thank all the brothers and sisters that were out there yesterday to help James and Sharice and her moving. Um, it was a, not only a, a hard work, but the fellowship and the, the good time that we had made it even better. So I just want to thank you guys that were out there to help them again. Um, I asked Jerry to sing that song. Um, if there's anything you take out of this today, um, anything that I say, I want you to just take that there's power in, in the blood of Christ, that that's where the power really lies. Um, I looked up in the dictionary the definition for the word usher. Um, an usher is a person that shows people their seats, either in a church, um, a theater or a wedding. Some of their responsibilities is to escort, accompany, help, assist, seize, leads, steers, pilots, shepherds, others. Um, when Gary O asked me to be a, an usher, I'm going to be honest, I really didn't want to do it. Um, I knew it came with responsibility. Um, I know uh, myself a little personal, and I am a responsible person, but I really don't like responsibility, but I can, um, how you say, take action when responsibility is there. Um, as an usher, I've seen a lot of things. Um, 
things we disciples could do better. Um, Forgive me if I sound judgmental. Um, I am the least perfect person here. I need a lot of help myself. But some of the things that ushers, that disciples could do better is being early for church. Um, it helps when you check your kids in early. It helps the teachers to prepare their, their classes. Um, Sitting close together um, helps too. Um, it avoids for one person to get up, grab the tray, and walk 10 seats down. I call those people my unknown ushers. <laughs> Pay more attention to the five minute clock. Um, it helps the singers and all that, you know, to start worship at, on time and to really get into Worshiping God. Uh, save those corner back seats for the elderly and um, for the women with babies. Um, there's one thing that I see that I say I, get, I can't get over. It worries me and it hurts God. When disciples decide not to take communion, Uh, they decide not to take communion, maybe because they had a bad week, a bad month, not feeling too spiritual, going through some trouble or unrepentant sin. When I gave up on God in the past, the first thing I started doing was not taking communion. So I understand. For me, it was unrepentant sin. The reality is we take away the value of the blood. We might not know it, but we think the blood can clean our sins no more. We say the blood of Jesus can help me no more. We make ourselves powerless like we've had the power in the first place. When the power is in Christ Jesus, he died, was tortured, and shed his blood on the cross. When the blood of Christ, when the blood of Christ has value, it empowers us motivates us to change. That's why we remember Christ. He poured out his blood that in good times and in bad times, the power is in the blood. It gives salvation to be with the Father for eternity. The power in the blood of Christ, the physical torture he went through brings honor to God when it brings good changes to our life. Don't give honor to sin or the trouble you might be going through. Uh, me and the group of brothers, we get together Saturdays, every other Saturday, and we've been reading this book titled Unshaken. Um, and chapter two is called um, The Done Deal. Um, the deal is done. Don't change because of what we've done or what we're doing. The deal motivates us to change. There is a scripture in that book, in that chapter, and it's in Romans 8. 35, verse 35 through 39, you can turn there if you like. It reads, who should separate us from the love of Christ? Should trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither, no, neither death nor life, neither angel nor demon, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither high nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to add something to verse 38. And it's neither a bad week, month, nor all the trouble you're going through will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I was a teen, about 14, 15, um, 
I was um, doing breaking an entry. As a matter of fact, I got caught twice in less than a month. Uh, the first one, the second party, or the accuser, never came to court. The other one, there was no eyewitnesses that I was inside the location. Like I said, I was about the age of 14 and 15, so I was a juvenile. Because of those technicalities, the judge decided to erase both charges from the books. Even though I was guilty in the system, it is like these crimes never happened. The same way, there's nothing I or you can do, good or bad, to make God love you less. Jesus died. That is the technicality that saves us once and for all. That is the power of the blood. Your sins are raised from the book like they never happened. I, I remember, I shared this before with people, but I didn't share this part. I remember standing in front of the judge, little boy, my handcuffs here, and mom, I'm sorry again. I look back, I look back and I see my mother there and she's just shedding tears. And, and, and right there and then I just decided, I said, no more, no more. And ever since then, I never broke into somebody's property again. When you take communion, let the blood of Jesus and the tears of God that he shed for your sin motivate you to change, similar to the way my mother's tears motivated me to change. It has the power. Let us pray for communion. Amen. Father God, thank you for how much you love us. Thank you um, for no matter where we at in our life, that we can remember you and remember the power that you, God, had set beforehand to send your son into this world, to die, to rise again, so we can have life with you, God, a relationship with you forever. I am so grateful, God, for this opportunity, God, to share that, God. And God, just help us always remember, God, that it is your son, God, and his sacrifice, God, that gives us salvation, gives us life, gives us peace, joy, happiness. And it is because of him, God, and his sacrifice, God, not because of what we, we do, but always and all the time remember that first and let that motivate us, God, to always put you first, to change, and to love you back because you loved us first. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
figure out the time here. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, there's a quick joke I want to say. It's about a rich man tells his wife, when I die, bury me with all my money. So the man died, the wife writes a check and puts it in his tomb. <laughs> um, the Bible says, store up your treasures in heaven. And I thought about that. I say, what God needs with money? What God needs with jewelry or gold? How can we store up treasures to take to heaven? I don't think what, that's what it means. I think it means look to your left and look to your right. I think what he wants is souls. And I think that's the treasure that he wants us to store up in heaven. Um, money is only needed here on earth. God don't need our money. The church does to help people get to heaven. Let's pray for contribution. Father God, um, thank you for this opportunity, God, to give, God. Help us have the right heart. Help the church, God, take this little bit that we get, God, and multiply by many. Father, there's nothing we cannot do with you and our side. So here, God, we give you our small sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Uh, the ushers are going to come forward and pass trays, and I'm just going to communicate to you some exciting things coming up in the near future, uh, opportunities for us to draw close to God, to one another, but also to have an impact in our community. Amen. Um, as we're worshiping today, we'll be gathered together next Sunday to worship God, but it's a, it's a special service because we're a congregation that believes that those who are younger should be preaching, singing, teaching, being involved. And so next Sunday, we're going to have a young adult service that comprises of young Marys, singles, and college students. They're going to be leading the worship next Sunday. And um, I just want to give you a little bit of a snippet. Is uh, preaching next Sunday will be Matt Butts and Alex Fillier. So they're going to be sharing the sermon. It's going to be awesome. Um, so let's look forward to that. Uh, before you leave today, make sure you grab a Worcester Weekly so you just know what's going on. I'm just going to highlight a few details regarding that. Again, we have an opportunity with these two next events to have an impact in our community. One is through uh, an amazing uh, door hanging event that uh, has really been a huge favorite here in Worcester, an opportunity to go into a community and knock on doors to let people know there's a great church here in Shrewsbury. So this coming uh, Saturday, July 27th, we're gonna be meeting in Northborough from 10 to 12 p.m. Um, other details will be followed with that. Make sure you grab a Worcester Weekly so we know. And any more questions, see Paul Butts regarding this incredible opportunity. Also too, coming August 3rd, that's a Saturday, we'll be back serving in the main South area uh, we will be serving with the Net of Compassion. On Saturday, August 3rd, we are uh, in great need of volunteers with setup, serving, and breakdown. Uh, please see John Minders Ma to volunteer. And then this Wednesday will be a midweek service. It'll be for the ladies, so you'll be gathered back together this Wednesday here, 7.30, uh, the women's midweek service. That'll be a great opportunity. Um, those are the announcements. Let's go ahead and stand. And we're going to have one song before Tom comes up to preach. I'm just encouraged that I'm still considered young. That's, that's yeah. fantastic. That's great. We're going to sing uh, I Hear God Singing to Me, which is a great song. Uh, as always, we want to encourage you to sing it with us. Well, I hear God singing to me. Every nation must be saved. Oh, I hear God singing to me. Every challenge must be prayed.
Good morning, church. It is great to be together. It's great to be in AC. Uh, I love it. I'm glad that we're here. Uh, Alberto, thank you for leading us in communion. Where are you? You're over there. Thank you. Amen. Again, if you're visiting with us, uh, with us a special welcome. Yesterday we had a, uh, an incredible wedding take place in the church uh, with, uh, with uh, Tika and Heather getting married. And maybe you're here this weekend because of that wedding or for some other reason. Either way, it's great to have you here. Uh, and I know that uh, that wedding yesterday just really solidified Mark and Laura. It's like, okay, they're going to be getting married in two weeks. And so uh, I'm sure that they're excited about that. 
Love is in the air. And that's a good thing because we're going to talk about love today. We're in a series, as you can see, called City Changers. And this whole concept of, of City Changers uh, is that God's plan to change your neighborhoods and to change your city and to change ultimately the planet is you and me, the church. That God doesn't just get us saved and then right away whisk us off into heaven, but he said, no, no, I want you to stay there because I have work for you to do. And that is, I want you to change, I want you to impact people's lives, neighborhoods, cities, countries, and he wants to do it through us. That's, isn't that just a little mind-blowing to think about? That world evangelism, God's plan, God's only plan, is you and me. That's a pretty uh, incredible thing to think about. Um, last week we looked at, in this topic of City Changers, we looked at a topic entitled those, uh, Loving Those Who Are Hard to Love. And uh, specifically, we focused on loving those who are hard to love outside of the church, those who aren't yet Christians. And we looked at the Acts chapter 10, the story of Acts chapter 10, with uh, Peter and Cornelius, and how God showed Peter through that uh, story that he wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, even Gentiles. And for you and I, that's an important story in the Bible because that applies to all of us as well. And so it's a, it, from that story, we learned how to love those who are hard to love, possibly outside the church. We looked at listening to and obeying the Spirit, that we should see all people as God does, as His image bearers, and that we should share the good news of Jesus with them. And when we do these things, then we will truly be loving those who may be hard to love. Now, you might say, yep, okay, that was great, I needed it, let's move on. No, let's park on this topic some more. <laughs> Loving those who are hard to love. Last week was outside the church. This week, let's focus on those inside the church. <laughs> Loving those who are hard to love in the church. Now, I know that doesn't apply to anybody in here or to the Worcester County Church of Christ, but let's look at the topic anyway, just in case maybe down the road you get, you know, a conflict with somebody in the church and you find them hard to love. Then you can apply this. So this, put this away as sort of a topic for future. <laughs> let's be honest. Let's be honest. It's hard to love people sometimes. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Especially those in God's church. Does anybody come in mind for you for loving someone hard to love in the church? Yeah, no pointing, no names, you know. And again, why are you all looking at me? I don't know. I'm looking at LJ. I don't know who else you're looking at. No. And, but it, it sounds strange to say, doesn't it, to admit at church, a room full of Christians, that we can find somebody hard to love. Wait, wait, wait a minute. If, if we're all Christians, if you're a Christian and I'm a Christian and he's a Christian and she's a Christian, then every time we get together, shouldn't it just be a love fest? But why is it so hard to love people sometimes? Well, to begin with, because the people is made up of, the church is made up of, People. The church, is, the church is not a building. The church isn't an address. The church is made up of people, God's people, saved people, yes, but still sinful people. And people can be hard to love, even those that we may consider brothers and sisters in the church. Now, let me ask you this, though. Okay, we, we know that some people may be hard to love, but what makes people, what makes Christians in the church hard to love them at times. Let me open it up. What makes people in the church hard to love sometimes? Without pointing fingers. Yeah. 
Okay, high expectations of each other that sometimes we don't meet and match those expectations. What else? If you were hurt multiple times, Chris. She took mine. Personality differences. Lower expectations, not high ones. Chris. Sometimes people have different opinions than me. Different opinions than you. <laughs> and they should all be like you. <laughs> Sometimes people don't listen. Is that true, Alberto? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I. I I, you, we still love them. I wrote down differences of opinions, right? Well, I think that, well, I think this. Sometimes you get more than two people together and boy, you got multiple opinions, hurt feelings, disagreements, hypocrisy that we see sometimes in one another, unmet needs or expectations I had written down that we see, sometimes we can then address that and say, brother, sister, da 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 da, -da and they come back with pride or defensiveness. And so we think, okay, that's enough of you. I'm, I'm going to stay clear of you. Uh, criticalness, lack of gratitude, complaining. To be blunt level honest, Christians sometimes are harder to love than those in the world. Because we're family. As one writer put it, the church would be great if it wasn't for all the people in it. And that's why sometimes Jesus commands, he commands us to love. And here, this is a challenging one. Look at this one in John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. How? How? Yeah, he says, and then by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus calls us the bar, the level, the expectation, the standard for loving each other is the way he has loved us. How many think that's a high calling? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough measure. So how do we do it? How do we love those in the church who are hard to love to that level, that expectation of Jesus loving us? Well, open your Bibles to John 21, and we're let in on a conversation that'll help us here. John 21 tells a story of a fishing expedition uh, that took place after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we don't know if it's several days, several weeks after his resurrection, but one day Peter says, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples say, okay, we'll go too. And so they go out fishing and they fish all night and they catch nothing, which if you read through the New Testament, you see that that happens multiple times. Yet some of these guys are fishermen, yet they, they're not catching much. Um, and, at, and then at first light, it says, a stranger was on the shore. Now, you and I are let into the fact that it's Jesus, but they didn't realize it at first. And the stranger stands on the shore at first light, sunrise, and they've been out fishing, haven't caught anything all night. And he says, friends, have you caught any fish? That just raises the frustration level of a fisherman. No. Jesus yells back, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll catch some. So they did, and sure enough, all of a sudden, they caught such a large number of fish that they couldn't even bring the net on board the boat. Right then, the Apostle John says, it's the Lord. And Peter does something a little odd. He says, it is the Lord, and immediately he takes off his outer garment and he jumps in the lake and swims to shore. He jumps in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and swims to shore. Why? Because it's the Lord. And Jesus already has a fire going and some bread going, and, and he goes, bring some of the fish and, and let's have breakfast. And so they break out a great breakfast together and they all eat. And then after that breakfast, a remarkable conversation takes place between Jesus and Peter. They go for a little walk, and we're let in on the conversation, and let's just pick it up in verse 15, John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Back in verse 15, Peter, do you truly love me more than these? We don't know what is the these that he's referring to. Maybe it was the hundred plus fish that were laying there on the shore and talking to a fisherman. That, that, that excites you. And so maybe he was looking at the fish going, do you truly love me more than these fish? Or maybe he was looking at and referring to the other disciples that were there uh, having breakfast. And, do you truly love me more than these guys? Point where we don't know what the these were, when he, what, what he's referring to, but he wanted to know if Peter loved him more than anyone or more than anything else. And Peter responds back with a strong, with an emphatic, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. In verse 15 and in verse 16, Peter was so sure of his love that he even appeals to Jesus' conscience. Lord, you know that I love you. You know this. Come on. Check your heart. You know I do. And so Peter pledges his love not once, not twice, but as we know, three times. And each time Jesus gives him a very simple, a very clear command. In other words, sort of like, okay, if you love me, then here's how I want you to show it kind of thing. Feed my lambs. Or, you know, take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And it's interesting that the, the, the Greek in there for lambs and sheep are both words that denote uh, young, little, tiny. Feed my tiny sheep. Feed my tiny lambs. And take care of, in other words, love those, feed those, tend to those, shepherd those young ones that are going to follow me in the faith. If you really love me, then this is how you, I want you to show it. Got me to thinking, what if we're, we're here, we're worshiping God, what if in the fellowship afterwards, Jesus is in the foyer? And Jesus goes, hey, Aaron, come here. Let's, work, let's just walk down the hallway together. And he goes, Aaron, I just want to know, do you love me? And then he, he grabs Gloria, Gloria, come here, come here. Let's just, I just want to know something. Do you love me? Really? What if he were to pull you aside today and ask you that question? How would you respond? Hopefully it would be, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And we'd probably even say, and I even, I want to love you more. I know it's not perfect, but I want to love you more, right? Hopefully none of us are going, I don't know if I love you or not. You know, hopefully we're like, hey, yeah, we want, yeah, I'm here at church, Jesus, come on. What would your response be? Would it be like Peter's? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know my heart for you. And if your response is similar to Peter's, then I think Jesus would give you a similar, very clear, very simple instruction. Do you really love me? And if Aaron or Gloria or any one of us said, yes, Lord, you know that I do, I think he'd say, then you know what? Show it by, by loving my church. Show it by loving the sheep right here sitting in this room. Now, before we get into what that looks like, and we'll, we're going to look at that here, um, I want you to just look at it again. Who is Jesus talking to here in John 21? Peter, right? He's, he's having a conversation with Peter. The same Peter who rejected him, not once, not twice, but three times. Just a few days, a few weeks earlier. The same Peter who said, I don't even know the man, is now saying, Jesus, you know that I love you. 
How could somebody who failed Jesus not once, not twice, three times publicly, emphatically, calling down curses on himself, I don't even know the man, how could he then, a few days or weeks later, say, I love you, you know I do. And how could Jesus trust him? Where he trusts him so much that he goes, if you love me, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, take care of the flock. How come Jesus isn't going, I can't even trust you with if you know me or not, much less I'm giving you this responsibility. But that's what he does. And I think, I think the story is in here to encourage us. Let me, and here's what I mean. How many of us have blown it in our love for God as a Christian? Look, it's a room full of failures. We have, we've all blown it. Yet you're sitting here. Why? Because you love him. Because you want to love him more. You're sitting here. Why are you worshiping him? Because you love him. And you want to love him more. How many of us have failed? All of us. Yet Jesus says, I still love you. And not just I still love you, but I'm calling you to love each other. If you love me, then I'm calling you to love my sheep sitting right here next to you. But how? How do we love people in the church who are hard to love? Let me just go through a few practicals here, okay? Here's one. See them as Jesus does. Now you might go, wait a minute, I was here last week. You used this same point last week. And, and yes, last week we did look at loving the lost and loving those outside the church. We need to see them as God does, his image bearers. That everybody is created in God's image. That means they are capable of having a relationship with God. And so if we are going to love them, then we need to see them as God does, which is his image bearers. The only, the only thing in all creation that is his image bearers are human beings. And so, yes, we need to see them that way. But as Christians, we are viewed by God, by Jesus, in a different way. We're not just image bearers. We are, as a church, the bride of Christ. Let me just uh, read Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, do, we have the, do, we, do we have Ephesians 5? We don't. Okay, then let me just read it to you. Um, it says this. And he's talking, it's, it's, it's talking about, he's using the reference of husbands and wives. And, and he says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And then he goes, oh yeah, in the same way, husbands, you ought to love your wives like this. And then a little farther down, just in case you're thinking, now wait a minute, is he talking about Jesus in the church or is he talking about husbands and wives? Paul says, I'm talking about Christ in the church. But the same thing applies to husbands and wives because Jesus views the church as his bride-to-be. And that he died for her, he gave himself up for her, the church, to present her holy and radiant and beautiful without stain or wrinkle or blemish. He wants his bride to be beautiful on her wedding day. Just like Heather was yesterday for Tika. She didn't roll in in jeans and a t-shirt and say, at least here I am, take it or leave it. You know, she prepared a little bit. And she was beautiful. And it, and there's other passages that talk about this. Revelation, when Jesus returns, here's what's going to be declared. Do we have revelation here? Let us rejoice and be glad and give, and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. The Lamb being Jesus. And his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Isn't it true so often in the New Testament and in Scripture? We see our relationship with God as a church, as he is the bridegroom, we are the bride. Right? That's how Jesus views his church. 
That's how he views all of us corporately together. This is my bride. How do you view the church? Is that how you view it? You know, it was amazing. Yesterday, uh, you know, weddings are so cool. I love white weddings because they give me such a taste of what heaven's going to be like. And, you know, and so the whole wedding party starts coming in, and there's Tika standing there, and, and you know the big time, the big moment, when all of a sudden, and here she is, she comes and she stands at the end of the row. And I look back at her, and she was just laser beam on him. She wasn't looking around at everybody, you know, like, she was right there, and that's it. And he, and then I look at him, and he's just blubbering. Yeah. And she comes walking towards him, and he's just... <laughs> and then you see him at their first dance when they, and eh, now, with the rest of Mr. and Mrs., and they come in, and they start dancing, and they're dancing, and you just look at him, and she's just looking up at him. She's not looking around. She's just, and she's just gazing at him, and it's just... Like, oh, I am in so in love with you. And he's looking at her just like, oh, you're so beautiful. You're so perfect. And I just think that's how it's going to be in heaven when we get to be with Jesus. Where all we're going to do is just look at him and, oh, like a bride to a bridegroom. That's how it's going to be. But is that how you see the church now? Imagine if I went up to Tika yesterday and I said, Tika, you know I love you, man. I love you. I am with you. I am so proud of you. But i got to be honest. Heather doesn't fire me up all that much. <laughs> she just, I don't like her. I don't, I don't love her. I don't even like her. Uh, you know, I see all of her flaws. Do you see her flaws? Let me point some of them out to you. And, 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 and her faults. You know, I think, Tika, I'll be honest, you could do a whole lot better. But I love you, man. How do you think Tika's going to respond? Do you think he's going to go, well, bro, at least you love me. That's where we're good, man. You love me. No. He's going to take it so personally. He's going to be so offended at my poor view of her, his bride, who he loves and just gave himself to. For me to go, mm, Tika, yeah, mm, her, no. <laughs> but we can do the very same thing with the church. Jesus is bride, can't we? Jesus, I love you. You died for my sins. I love you. I am yours. But your church, this bride ain't the prettiest, I'll tell you that. The church, I see all the flaws and faults and warts and ugly stuff, and this is wrong, and this is bad, and this doesn't work right, and oh, Jesus, you could do a whole lot better. And we might not come right out and say those words, but we can sure think very similar to that. This is wrong, this is bad, this thinks, this, this on and on and on and on and on. How do you think Jesus is going to respond? Well, at least you love me. We're cool. You're probably right with regards to the church. She's a loser. I really, uh, you know, I don't love her all that much anyway, but it's the best I can do. Do you think he's going to respond that way? No. He takes great offense if we do not love his bride. How we think, how we feel, how we treat the church is how we think, how we feel, how we treat Jesus. You can't separate and go, I love you, Jesus, I'm yours. Ugh. No, how you think and feel and treat each other is how we, the same thing for Jesus. And you might go, oh, how do you know that's how? Remember in Acts chapter 9, when Saul is going around persecuting the church, right? And, and he's breathing out murderous threats, it says, and he's arresting Christians, and he, he's even approving of their death at times. And Jesus comes along and says, let me just knock you off your horse here a little bit, and blinds him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? me? 
So he could go, wait a minute, I'm not persecuting you, Lord. I'm persecuting these Christians. Jesus, in his mind, though, no, no, no. They and me are one. How you think, how you treat, how you talk about the bride is how you feel about me. You want to love those in the church who are hard to love? Then see them as Jesus does. His bride. The way Tika looked at Heather. It's how Jesus looks at his church. How else do we love those in the church? Lay down your life for them. Turn to 1 John with me. 1 John chapter 3. First John 3, and he gives us a definition of love here, but also a command, a challenge along with love. He says this, 1 John 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Good, I'm, we're, gonna, we're let in on the secret of how, what is love. He goes this, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and now we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And he goes on and he gives us an example. He says, if somebody has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. In other words, love is as love does. Not as the love is as love says. No, love is as love does is what he's saying here. And so offering, he, here's what, Jesus laid down his life for us, now here's what we want you to do. Lay down your lives for each other. Do you love me, Jesus says, and you go, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then he goes, lay down your life for the person sitting next to you. Look around for a second at each other. Jesus is saying, lay down your life for Rosie. Lay down your life for Tim Rayburn. Lay down your life for Mora. Lay down your life. Yes, for LJ. Lay down your life for him. <laughs> Jesus, that's a high calling. <laughs> Lay down your life for him. You know why I pick on LJ so much? Because I love him so much. <laughs> Don't just lay down your life for the ones who are easy to love, but for everybody. And, and, you know, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I think love isn't just shown in the really big acts that we do, but I think even more so it's shown in the little acts, the small everyday kind of little things that really show love. When we serve one another, when we lay down our life for one another in the little things, I think that's when love is shown. I want to show a, a quick news clip. Uh, maybe you've seen this on TV, take a look. Instead of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, he pulled one out of a California wildfire. It happened on Highway 1 when this unidentified man got out of his car to try and rescue a panicked rabbit. The man seemed to panic, frantically gesturing as he watched the bunny heading into the flames, practically begging it to come to him. Finally getting down on his knees and reaching for the wild rabbit, at last managing to scoop it up. The accolades on social media started breeding like rabbits. And just like that, my faith in humanity is restored, read a typical tweet. From zero to crying in 0.2 seconds, read another. Some tweeted on behalf of their pets. Our bunny and kitty approve of this young man. There was the occasional naysayer. Wild animals do not need to be saved from fires, argued a writer for Slate, saying the man could have been injured as well as anyone who had to come to his rescue. But most paid tribute. Bunnies need heroes too. They have one in this man. Adding to the halo around this guy is the fact that he declined the photographer's request for an on-camera interview. As one poster put it, and he didn't want to be on camera in L.A.? Obviously, this is Jesus himself in shorts and a hoodie. Take it from Jefferson Airplane. And here you go, chasing rabbits. And you know you're going to fall. 
But he didn't fall. He just walked away from the flames, holding the bunny, destination unknown, leaving this video of a rabbit saved from a wildfire to spread like one. Genimo, CNN, New York. All right, there you go. And I saw this and I thought, how did the rescue of a little rabbit make national news? I mean, it's not like the guy saved a whole herd of rabbits or thwarted off the fires from a neighborhood or anything like that. He saves one little bunny and it makes national news and, and, and media all over. Why? Because this guy laid down his life for some, something that we would view as insignificant. Something that we would, it's just a rabbit. A wild one at that. It's not like he, he was a pet ever since the kid was young. No, this is just a wild rabbit. And it's just, it's in the little things. It, he shows compassion to the smallest of creatures that one day, and it becomes a viral sensation. Folks, that's how we can show love to one another. Again, it doesn't have to be this big, grand show and act of love. I mean, it can be in the small things that we do, in the little things that we do. When my wife goes shopping, sometimes it seems it's rare, I know, but sometimes she'll come home and say, I was thinking of you. And she'll pull out maybe like a box of Pop-Tarts and set them down. And she knows they're not good for me, but for me, I'm like, Pop-Tarts, she loves me. <laughs> My son Jesse knows that I like Twizzlers, that the filled kind. They're the yellow and red, and they're filled, and they're just so good. They're so bad, they're good for you. And, uh, and one day, Jesse comes home from work, and he's got a bag. And he walks in, and Sidney, you're like, what's in the bag? And he goes, oh, here. And he brings out something, and he gives it to Sid, and then he brings out a bag of Twizzlers. And he goes, here, Dad. I felt love. <laughs> you know, I think uh, helping James and Cherie move yesterday, was it hot? Did we lose a lot of weight and sweat? <laughs> yeah, we did. And, and again, was it like one big, wow, this is just going to take up my whole weekend and that's just it? No, it was literally like 8.30 to 11.30, we were done moving an entire house out of one into another. And I was so proud of the church because we had so many people come out to help. And you might go, man, it was just, it's just a little thing. You helped somebody move. Let's call CNN. But to them, they came up to me last night at the wedding, and they said, oh, I got to just tell you, thank you so much. We felt so loved. That's exactly the point. That's why we do it. Uh, I, you know, uh, earlier this week, we, on Wednesday, when we had to cancel the tailgate here, and, and our family went over to the Madays, and, hey, Lori, what'd you do today? Cut someone's grass in the church. And if you know Lori Madej, you know that she doesn't just sit around going, I wish I had something to do. The woman is busy. And yet here she is cutting somebody else's grass. <laughs> there you go. That, that, to me, that's a little thing, but it's love. You know, with, Paul, with Paula being laid up because of surgeries and all that, and hey, let's bring cards and let's encourage her, and Mari decides, yeah, I'll put together a basket, and we'll get it all together, and everyone contributes, and she makes this awesome basket, and I'm sure Paula probably felt like such love and gratitude from the whole church. She made a basket. Woo! but it showed love. A few weeks ago, I'm standing up there after the fellowship, after church, and Paula Abasta comes up to me with a, a Tupperware container, and he goes, here. And I said, what's this? He goes, my wife just made strawberry rhubarb pie, and she knows that you love strawberry rhubarb pie, so she made it, and here's two pieces. I felt love. <laughs> she could have said while she's cutting it at home, <laughs> Tom missed out on this pie. But she, no, 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 let's save two pieces for him. And I savored those all that week. <laughs> That's love. Remember what Jesus did to, remember when Jesus, the night he was betrayed, when he, he says, I'm now going to show them the full extent of my love. 
He doesn't like, you know, elevate in fr ele you know, um, you know, levitate in front of them, or he doesn't like, you want to see something, look at heaven, Boop, you know, or anything like that. What's he do to show the full extent of his love? He gets down on his knees the night he was going to be betrayed, and he washes their feet. All 12, even Peter, who was going to deny him a few hours later, even Judas, who was going to betray him that very night, let me wash your feet to show the full extent of his love. Amen. Serving others isn't always easy. It's not always fun. It's not always convenient or comfortable. In fact, most of the time it's not. But Jesus calls us to do it anyway. Not out of duty, out of love. And so Jesus says, do you really love me? Do you really love me? And you, we would say, yes, your Lord, you know I do. Then serve somebody in the church. It doesn't have to be some grand thing. Just little things. And, and you know, and it's just it's in the small things. And you probably, oh, I can't lay down. My, look, at, there's over 200 people in the church. I can't lay down my life for all 200. Okay, but I'm sure you can for one this week. Jesus, again, love is as love does. Um, you know, there's other things I, I want to preach on, but I'm, I'm running out of time. And so let me just, I'll just hit on them real quick. I won't even look at my notes. Here's one. You want, if Jesus says, you love me, then be committed to the bride. Be committed to the bride, the church. You can't say, Jesus, I love you, and then treat the bride as, well, I'll show up when it's convenient for me in my schedule. That's not love. And so, well, you know, midweek, eh, I don't have to go. I'm tired. Well, boy, what if I just didn't show up at home this week? Well, Sid, I was tired, so I just I didn't show up. And, and I bring this up because this is, I start to see this as a, a, a little trend going on where people aren't showing up. They think it's optional. I don't need to show up. I don't need to love the bride. I'll just show up on Sundays. That's good enough. It's hard to get love or give love if you're not here. Sundays, Wednesdays, when we meet in small groups. And when you're not here, you think, well, there's 200 other people. They won't even notice me. Oh, it, you're noticed. And we feel it. And that's why even uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, it talks about this. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We've been getting into a bad habit, church. Let me, I'm just talking to the church here. We've been getting in a bad habit. Let's break bad habits. Amen. When the body meets, let's be here. Why? Again, not out of duty, so we can go check, but out of devotion to the bride Amen. and to one another. Uh, and, and lastly, and, and this is a whole sermon in and of itself, forgive one another. How can I love those who are hard to love? Well, forgive them. How many of you have ever been hurt or sinned against in God's church? then that's it, we ought to go somewhere else. No, not at all. No, it's be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. How? Just as Christ God forgave you, bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Again, the whole forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. How did God forgive you? Completely? 100%? Fully? So how should you forgive those in the church? And, and I know sometimes we can be like Peter and go, but how many times am I supposed to forgive Chris? Seven? Jesus says, uh, no, 77 times seven. You know, in other words, keep giving. Let me ask you this. How often do you want God to forgive you? Do you want him to put a cap on it? 77 times, no more. No. And so how many times should you forgive each other in the church? But how easy it is to hold a grudge. How easy it is to just avoid them in the fellowship. We would rather not have the conflict of having to address it. We'd rather just sweep it under the rug and just not deal with it. Satan loves that. Forgive each other. Bear with one another. 
help one another make it to heaven. Don't hold a grudge. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't pull back your heart. Don't gossip and talk about them. Don't avoid them in the fellowship. Forgive them. Jesus didn't say this is going to be easy, this whole love in the heart to love people. But he did say it's essential. It's not easy, but it's essential. Let's see the church as Jesus does, his bride. And let's lay down our life for each other in serving one another. And maybe it's just in the little things. Let's lay down our life for one another in being committed to one another. Yeah, it'd be much easier to stay home and watch TV, but I'm going to be committed to the body. And let's lay down our life for one another and forgive each other when there is something that comes up. And when we love like that, then we'll be able to love those who are hard to love. Thanks a lot. Amen. Thank you, Tom, again for an amazing lesson. That was very encouraging and also very challenging, so thank you. If you guys could all please stand up, we'll have one uh, closing song. <laughs>